Okay, we're in Shabbos, uh, Perak Yod, Mishnah Aleph. Yod Aleph. Let's get some English in here. Okay. One who stores seeds for sowing or as a sample or for medicinal purposes and carried it out on Shabbos is liable for carrying out any amount. By storing that measure, he indicates that it's significant to him. So, yeah. Um, any other person is only liable for carrying out on Shabbos if he carries out its measure. If one stored the seed, um, carried it out, and then brought it back in with no intention of using it for the specific purpose for which he stored it, my note says, he's only liable if he brought in its measure for liability. Um, base. One who carried out food from his house on Shabbos and placed it on the threshold of the door, whether he then carried it it out from the threshold to the public domain or another person carried it out, he's exempt because he did not perform the prohibited labor um, all at once. Similarly, if one placed a basket that's full of fruit on the outer thresh threshold, which is in the Rishus Arabim, and part of the basket remained inside, even though most of the fruit is outside in the public domain, he is exempt until he carries out the entire basket. Gimel. One who carries out an object into the public domain on Shabbos, whether he carried it out on his right hand or his left hand, whether in his lap or on his shoulder, he's liable. Because that's uh, uh, all these are typical methods for carrying out objects, as this was the method for carrying the uh, things for the Mishkan employed by the sons of Kahat in the Midbar. Um, but one who carries out an object in an unusual back, like the back of his hand or with his foot or his mouth or his elbow or his ear or his hair or with his belt, who's, or mine says belt, but I, I think it's, um, or like a money purse open facing downwards or between yeah. his belt and his cloak or with the hem of his cloak or with his shoe or with a sandal, he is exempt because he did not carry it out in the manner typical for those who carry. Okay, so this carries on in a similar in a similar vein in Mishnah Dalad. So somebody was intending to carry something slung around him in front of him, um, and while he was uh, wrapped up in discussion, he walked out and, and, and it was actually hanging to the back of him. Okay, so now there is patter. Why? Because when something's in front of you, it's got a good shmirah. You're watching over it. When something's behind you, you can get pickpocketed, you can fall off, some things can happen to it, and you won't notice. Okay, so because it's on, on a lower, it, it's degraded, it, you know, his, his shmirah on, on the object is a little bit degraded, so it's uh, it's less, um, so, so it's not con it's considered a shinoi, right? Now, Ahrab, if, however, he was intending to carry it behind him, and it swung around so that by the time he got to Rosh Hashirabim, it was in front of him. Yeah, there is Chayev, because now it's better than what he was thinking of doing. Okay. Be'emes, Amru, Be'emes. When you see Be'emes in a, in a Mishnah, they say, this is Halacha. We don't always pass on Halacha exactly like the Mishnah. But, uh, but when it says Be'emes, we say, oh. Okay. Be'emes, Amru, Ha'isha, Ha'chol, Geris, Be'esinar. So a woman's wearing... Well, um, Sinar in, in modern parlance is an apron, but I think uh, the translation I saw was a petticoat. Um, Mine's, mine says it's a pant, pants-like thing that's worn beneath the outer garment. So I guess petticoat would make sense, yeah. but mine says girded, so it's it's wrapped up like pants, so maybe like a... Okay. Well, it, I don't know if it makes sense the way I'm understanding it as a as a sinar, uh, as as a petticoat because a petticoat is like uh, can rotate. So bein milafaneha bein milacharecha chayeves. So so whether so if she is, so now she basically has she has something strapped to her petticoat, and she's and she's going to carry it out because it, you know, it's it's uh, it's attached to her petticoat, um, and whether it whether it is in front of her or behind her. She's high of why she came not only yourself was there because the nature of the petticoat is that it does rotate it slips around as she moves it might it might turn around and when she puts it on she's perfectly aware that it's uh, that her petticoat moves mm -hmm. but pants doesn't make sense because pe pants don't move they, they're they're yeah, the legs <laughs> yeah so I think I think petticoat is a good translation it anyway makes more sense. Uh, yeah. 
um, because so so just because it, just because it slipped from in front of her to behind her, that's no longer patur as it was at the beginning of the mission. Because when she puts it on, it's the, that's just the nature of things that you know that they're going to move. Rabbi Yehuda Amir Af Mekable Piskin says the same goes for Mekable um, Piskin. So those are shlichim, um, a uh, messenger. Uh, so. For example, they bring they bring letters from one place to another, and they put them into a into a reed uh, or, in, or into some a wooden tube that they that they hang from their from their belt uh, um, or from their neck, and just the nature of the way, of this attachment is uh, is that it swings from side to side and can go from back to the front and front to back, and since the, since they know ahead that this is what it does. Even if they put it in front of them initially and then they carried it into the Rosh Hashanah and it was behind them, they're still higher for that. Okay, same as the as the woman with the with the petticoat. Mishnah, hey, Hamotzi Kikar le Rosh Hashanah Somebody takes um, a Kikar is a loaf of bread. Okay, so that's simple enough, but obviously there's more to come. Hotzi Uhu Shnayim, two people grabbed this loaf together and carried it into the Rosh Hashanah. It's her in. That's not normal, right? It's not a normal thing for to have two people holding onto a loaf of bread and carrying it out. So therefore, they are. So therefore, they are patur. Um, it's, is that that is because of shino? Let me just make sure that I, that I got that right. Any more in the question? Okay. So it's a, It's actually from a, a drasha from im nefesh achas tichte. If one if one person it says it specifically says that one person does a does an avera bishkaga uh, doing uh, and the derasha is basosa is that he if only if he does all of it only if he does all of it and not if somebody does partially it does it partially so that's why uh, why they patter. However, if it's one of these massive loaves that uh, you know like you have at a wedding. Um, and uh, and it's not it's not easy for one person to carry it, but two people it makes sense for two people to carry it. Uh, then they're both part, then they're both chayav. Okay, uh, Elias is joined. Hello, hello, good morning. Um, we're we're holding in yud uh, yud hay. Okay, I'm right there. Um, I'm, well? you know, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm 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 explaining this one. Um, so we're saying that if, if one person carries out a loaf into the Rishas Arabim, he's, he's higher, but if two people patter, however, if it's a large loaf that you need two people to, to carry, then they're both higher. Rabbi Shimon Potter. However, Rabbi Shimon says, even in such a case where you need two people to do the malacha and two people did the malacha together, Rabbi Shimon patters. Why? Because, it could, uh, because even a malacha, a malacha that one person couldn't do by himself, um, but, and two people did, they, they patter, it might be because in nefesh achas techta, because he does a drasha on on the nefesh achas, and says it has to be one person doing it. Even if it's even if it's a malacha that you need two people for, and two people did it, uh, he still says it's it's patur just as there is a kasev. However, the halacha doesn't follow Rabbi Shimon; it follows the Tanakama who says that uh, that, that both people are chayav. Hamotzi ochlin pachlas mi kashi or betli. If uh, if somebody takes out um, food in a, inside a kli, now the, but the but the food is less than a krogeris. Okay, we need we need a krogeris of food in order to be higher for carrying it to the Rosh Hashanah. But he took it out in a teacup. Okay, and so it's less so it's less than the share of food, but you've taken out a full teacup. What does the halacha say? Uh, he's a patur afal kli. Not only is he patter for the food, which is the less than the required share, but he's even patter for taking the kli into the Rosh Hashanah, kli tefelelo, because the kli is tuffled to the to the food. You hear that? Right. Because that's, that even though it's a, even though it's a full on kli, and if he carried it out empty, he would have been chayav. But now that it's, there's something in it, he's patter. There's another nice riddle question for you. Where is there a case where if you carry where if you carry something? Um, something into the Rishas Rabim, it's your 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 chayev. But if you put it, if you put something into it, then you patter. You carry or something. You, you know, you could you could put it a little more cryptically if you like. But there's a but that's another one of those counterintuitive little little things that uh, that you see in the halacha. 
Okay. Es hachai b'mita, if a person carries a, a living person out into the street uh, in a bed. Okay, well, I'm, presumably you need two people, but as we saw above, if you need two people to carry the bed out into the Rishas Rabbi, you'd, you'd still be chayav on it normally. So if, if you were just carrying the bed, these two people would be chayav. But since there's a person inside the bed, pater afalamita, because we have a principle that chay no says atma, a living person carries himself. So if you carried somebody on your shoulders in the Rishos Rabbim, you'd be pater. I don't think it's permitted to do such a thing, but, uh, but if you did it, you'd be pater because uh, it's considered that a living person carries himself, you're not carrying him. Okay? okay. So the same thing goes for the, for the guy in the bed. If you carry him out, you pater. However, if he takes a dead body in a bed out into the Rishos Rabbim, he's chayav. Um, and similarly, even if it's just a small amount, if it's just a, a piece of, of, of a corpse or from a, from a novella, or even an adasha from a sheritz, if you, if you carried those out, you'd be, you'd be high up, because those are, those are the minimum shearing for them to be significant in terms of tumor, and those are also the shearing for them to be high up. For carrying to the Rishas Rabbim. Now, Rabbi Shimon and Pater, is it, you're in the case of the, of, the, of the mace. Why? Because what are you doing when, when a person takes, takes a mace out into the Rishas Rabbim and takes him out of, out of the Rishas Yachid into the Rishas Rabbim? Is it because he wants the mace to be in the Rishas Rabbim? No. It's because he wants the mace not to be in his house. Okay. So, therefore, what we have over here is a new category which, uh, which we're learning over here called a Malacha Sha'ena Tshichel Gufa. You don't need you don't need the malacha for the goof of the malacha. You need it because of uh, because of some other reason. So a classic example is somebody wants sand. Okay. Leaving aside the fact that sand is mukta, we're talking on a Doraisa level over here. Okay, so somebody wants some sand, so he goes and digs a hole so he can have the sand. Now digging a hole is uh, is a malacha of, of bone, uh, right? So, um, that, that's a you 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 you'd, you'd be high for for building or uh, is it is it is it okay? is there a separate one? I'm not sure. I think it's I think it's a part of Bonnet. Um, but doing but digging the hole is a malacha do once it gets to, once it gets to be significant enough. But he doesn't want the hole. He just wants the sand. So that's called a malacha she'en etzrichel gufa. And while it's asked to do it, Rabbi Shimon holds that you're pater for for that, and. Um, I believe that the that the halacha follows Rabbi Rabbi Shimon over here. Um, oh, actually, no. You know what? There's a machlokis in the Rishonim. The Rambam paskins kula se malacha b'shabes af al pi she'ena tzarich le legufa shel malacha chayav aleha. So that's the Rambam says that he is chayav for malacha she'ena tzarich legufa. The yesh sovrim shalocha ke Rabbi Shimon. That's the Rambam and the and the Rashba, the Ramban and the Rashba. So um, pick your side. There, there's some big-shouldered Rishonim who hold in either direction on this Mach Lokas so Okay, so, um, so we have the uh, we have the, uh, the two sides of our, of our debate uh, in terms of Melach Hashem and Shekhala Gufa. Okay, Mishnah Vav, Hanotel Tzipanav Zobazo. Somebody picks at, at his fingernails with his other fingernails in, in order to, to cut them off. Um, I don't recommend this, but if somebody has is a, uh, and, uh, does this, or Bishinab, or if he bites his nails, uh, same thing if he if he pulls out his hair, if he pulls out his mustache or, or his beard, and somebody who braids hair, or kocheles, or somebody who um, puts on eyeshadow, um, no, what's the pokesis is putting um hmm? it says if there it paints the, her eyes or parts her hair right she parts her hair um with uh i think it's uh this there must be some substance that she's putting or, or some some other some sort of substance that she's putting to keep her hair parted or she puts um another, another opinion is that uh, for kisses is putting uh putting rouge on her face okay in all of these cases Rabbi Eliezer Machayev, he says these are all cases of a Chiyot Daraisa, it's an Isra Daraisa to do them. 
Chachamim osrin mishum shvus, but Chachamim say this is just Darabonim. He says that braiding or parting the hair is a, a told us of, of a bonum building. Right. Right, and so in, in and and in terms of the other in terms of the other things of cutting your nails in, in different in all these different ways, Rabbi Eliezer says that there is a, it's a chag deraisa, but Chachamim says it's only Darabonim. However, if you're using actually a cleave, if you're using a scissors or a, 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 a nail clipper to do your nails or anything like that, of course, then you'd be high of the Doraisa. Um, yeah. um, if somebody uproots something from a, from a flower pot that's got holes in the bottom, Chayev. Okay, because the holes in the bottom uh, we consider is attached to the ground. And it's uh, and is is high for, for for uprooting something from that plant. The um, If however it's it's not connected to the ground, if it's if, if the the flower pot doesn't have any holes, in his potter. Um, but Rabbi Shimon potter was there. Rabbi Shimon says forget it. Flower pots are never connected to the ground, even if they got holes. But the halacha doesn't follow Rabbi Shimon. Yeah, you're going to stop there, and I'm going to go and catch Shachris. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Have a great job. Okay. okay. Good job, guys. Good By the way, would you like to, would you like to carry on uh, learning between the two of you, and I'll uh, I'll actually leave it in the recording if you want. Um. Sure. I just don't have the the spots. So, Eliezer, if you if you know where we're going. Okay. So so go to mishnah.jjc.info. No, I have it. I have it in my in my tissues. So. Uh, don't 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 rely on Eliezer's tissues. They are not always reliable. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm putting it into the chat for you. Okay, I found it. So going back to on uh, Vovket. Okay, so I'm gonna make you the um I'm gonna do the computer we can. Okay. Trust That's... sometimes is also wrong, so don't you know <laughs> <laughs> can't trust can anything. <laughs> See ya. Have a good Thank job. You. Thank you. Bye. Okay. I have I have um Vovket. Do you have that also? Sure. Uh, let's see. Is it in the list? Shabbos Vavres. Okay. Let me see. The, uh, and then there's Tess. And then Yud. Yep, that's, that looks right. Let's do it. An amputee may go out with his wooden foot. These are the words of Reb Mayer, but Reb Yossi permits, uh, prohibits it. If it has a cavity for pads, it is susceptible to tumor contamination. He, his knee pads are susceptible to midrash contamination, and he may go out with them on Shabbos or enter the temple courtyard with them. His stool and his supports are susceptible to midrash contamination, and he may neither go out with them on Shabbos or enter the temple, or enter the temple court, courtyard with them. Masks are not susceptible to tumor contamination, and we may not go out with them on the Shabbos. Can we use that as a header? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Wait, I'm lost here. I'm going to... Above test. His chair and supports. And let me not go out with that. Okay. Yeah, my, my translation doesn't translate that. It's just, just calls them lokitamin. Okay. Um, tests. Uh, young boys may go out on Shabbos with knots uh, as a folk remedy and princes with bells. And any person is permitted to go out on Shabbos with those objects. However, the sages spoke at the present addressing, I guess they ask, can my boy go out with these knots or can these princes go out with their bells? Yeah, anybody can do it. But they said boys and princes because that's the that was the situation they were dealing with at that at that moment. Yud, we may go out with a locust egg or with a fox's tooth or with a nail from the gallows for the purpose of healing. These are the words of Rebmeyer. But the Kakamans say, even on weekdays, these are forbidden because of the prohibition against following in the ways of the Emirates. This, I guess, was the vote of Zora. So, yeah. That's that. Cool. All right. Orla, base. Orla. Or, Orla. Orla should be um, base um, Yud Gimel. Yep. Okay. Vessels which were oiled with unclean oil, and later they returned and oil. He returned and oiled them with clean oil, 
where he first oiled them with clean oil and later returned to them and oiled them with unclean oil, Rabbi Eliezer says, I go after the first. The sages say, after the last. Mm-hmm. Um, if leaven of truma or the killer hakarim fell into dough, and neither this suffices to leaven nor that suffices to leaven, but together they leavened, it is forbidden to non priests but permitted to priests. And Reb Shimon permits to non priests and to priests. Okay. Seasonings of truma and of kilayim uh, of the vineyard, kilayakarim, that fell into a dish. And there's not enough uh, of one to season, nor is there of the other to season, but together they seasoned. Uh, the dish is prohibited to non-Kohanim, but permitted to Kohanim. Maybe Shimon declares it permitted to non-priests and to priests. Um, we are on uh, Shvius to the end. Tess. Tess. Um, Tess. Tess. Uh, Vav. Okay, it should be this. If one gathers fresh herbs until the moisture has dried up, and if one gathers dry until the second rainfall, leaves of reeds and of vines until they fall from their stems, and if one gathers dry until the second rainfall, Rebbe Kiva says all of them until the second rainfall. Similarly, if one rents a house to someone, quote, until the rains, he means until the second rainfall. Or if one has vowed not to derive any benefit from his friend, quote, until the rains, he's prohibited until the second rainfall. Um, until when may the <clears throat> until when may the poor enter the orchards? Until the second rainfall. And when may one begin to enjoy or burn the straw and stubble of of Shavius produce after the second rainfall? Second rainfall is where it's at. Um. I just I just missed my page here. Okay, here we are. Um, nine eight. Okay, if one had produce for the seventh year and beer time arrived, Arab uh, Pesach he allots food for three meals for each, and the poor may eat after beer, but not at not not the rich. So says Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi says, but the both the poor and the rich may eat after beer. Beer. Okay. Taros. Okay. Taros Daladov. Um. Let's see. I have a dollar off. Yes. Yep. Okay, um, if one throws truma from place to place, whether he throws a loaf among keys or a key among loaves, the loaves are tahor. Rabbi Yehuda says, if one throws a loaf among keys, the loaf is tame. But if one throws a key among loaves, the loaves are tahor. A dead sheritz that was held in the mouth of a weasel that was passing over loaves of truma uh, and it's doubtful whether the sheriffs did or did not touch them. In such a condition of doubt, the loaves are clean. Okay. Um, if a sheriff was uh, gimel, if a sheriff was in the mouth of a weasel or a nevela in the mouth of a dog, and they passed between the tahor people or the tahor people passed between them, this doubt is ruled tahor, since the tuma does not have a place. If they were picking the sherets or nevela on the ground, and a tahor person said, I walked to that place, but I do not know whether I touched the tame item or I did not touch it, the uncertainty is ruled tame because the tuma has a place. Is it in motion or not in motion? Um, okay. Dalad? Dalad. Oh, no, we're good. Uh, it's... The, that was three. I'll, I'll lift that gimel. So now we're at Menachos Dalid Gimel. Okay. Let's put this over here. Okay, Dalid Gimel. The bull, the rams, the lambs, and the goat are not essential to the validity of the bread, nor is the bread essential to this validity. The bread is essential to the validity of the lambs, but the lambs are not essential to the validity of the bread. These are the words of Rabbi Akiva. Said Reb Shimon ben Nanas, not so. Rather, the lambs are essential to the validity of the bread, while the bread is not essential to the validity of the lambs. For we may find that when Israel was in the wilderness for 40 years, the lambs were offered without bread. Therefore, now too the lambs can be offered without bread. Reb Shimon says, the, uh, said Reb Shimon, the halakha follows the words of Reb ben Nanas, but not for that reason. 
his reason, whatever, for whatever is mentioned in the book of uh, Numbers, Leviticus is, was offered in the wilderness, and whatever is mentioned in Leviticus is not offered in the wilderness. But once they came to the land of Israel, both these and those were offered. Why then do I say that lambs may be offered without bread? Because the lambs render themselves permissible without bread, but the bread without the lambs has nothing to render permissible. Okay. Dalit. Failure to sacrifice the daily offering does not prevent sacrifice of the additional offerings, and likewise failure to sacrifice the additional offerings doesn't prevent the daily offerings. And failure to sacrifice some of the additional offerings on a day when more than one is sacrificed, for example, uh, Shabbos Rosh Chodesh, it does not prevent sacrifice of the other additional offerings. If the priests did not sacrifice a lamb in the morning as the daily offering, nevertheless, they should sacrifice a lamb in the afternoon as the daily offering. As failure to sacrifice one daily offering does not prevent sacrifice of the other. Um, Rabbi Shimon said, when does this halacha apply? At the time when the failure to sacrifice the daily morning offering was because they were prevented from sacrificing it due to circumstances beyond their control, or they failed to sacrifice it by accident. But if the unwittingly, but if the priests acted intentionally and did not sacrifice the lamb in the morning as the daily offering, they should not sacrifice the lamb in the afternoon. Um, so the note, incense was burned twice a day, half a measure in the morning, half a measure in the afternoon. If they did not burn the half measure of incense in the morning, they should burn the half measure in the afternoon. Rabbi Shimon says, in such a case, the entire measure was sacrificed in the afternoon. The reason for the difference between the daily offerings and the incense is that the daily service um, on a new golden altar is initiated only with the burning of the incense of the spices in the afternoon, at which time they would burn a full measure. In the daily service on the new altar of the burnt offerings, on which the daily offerings were sacrificed, is initiated only with the daily morning offering. And use of the new table was initiated only with the arrangement to the showbread on Shabbos. And use of a new menorah was initiated only with the kindling of its seven lamps in the afternoon. The Kavitim of the Kohen Gadol was, uh, were not, the Kavitim of the Kohen Gadol were not brought by halves. Rather, he brings a full Isseron and divides it and offers half in the morning and half in the afternoon. If the Kohen offered half in the uh, morning and died, and they appointed another Kohen in his place, he should not bring half an Isseron of his own, nor the half of the first one's Isseron. Rather, he brings a full Isseron, divides it in half, and he offers half, and half is destroyed. Thus, two halves are offered and two halves are destroyed. If they did not appoint another Kohen from whom it was brought, Reb Shimon says, from the public. Reb Yehuda says, from the heirs, and it was offered whole. Okay. And last is Nadarim. Nadarim uh Hey? One who makes a nether preparing a bed is permitted the footstool. These are the words of Reb Meir. The Kakaman, however, say a footstool is included in the term bed. One who makes a nether prohibiting a footstool is permitted the bed, and one who makes a nether prohibiting a city is permitted to enter the tachum of the city, but it is forbidden to enter the extension. But one who makes a nether prohibiting a house is forbidden from the door frame and inward. Okay. Um, one who says, this produce is going on for me, or is konam upon my mouth, or is konam to my mouth, is prohibited to partake of the produce, or of its replacements, or of anything that grows from it. If he said, this produce is konam for me, and for that reason I will not eat it, or for that reason I will not taste it, it is permitted for him to partake of its replacements, or of anything that grows from it. This applies only with regard to an item whose seeds cease after it is sown. However, with regard to an item whose seeds do not cease after it's sown, for example, bulbs which flower and enter into a foliage period and repeat the process, it is prohibited for him to partake even of the growths of its growths as the original prohibited item remains intact. Zion, one who says to, is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. One who says to his wife, Kohanam, your handiwork to me, they are Kohanam from my mouth or they are Kohanam to my mouth. He has forbidden whatever is received in exchange for them and whatever grows from them. With respect to my eating, with respect to my tasting, he has permitted whatever is received in exchange for them and whatever grows from them. If it is a thing whose seed decomposes for the thing whose seed does not compose, 
uh, even what is grown from, what, I'm sorry, even what is grown from what is grown is forbidden. Yeah. All right. All right. That's it. Okay. Have a great Shabbos, Riley. You and too. Show on Sunday. Okay. okay. See you then. Bye. Bye. Let me see.